What is the Internet of Things? Is it hardware, software, or both? Well, chances are you already have it in your pocket. It might be on your wrist. Recently popular are fitness bands with accelerometers and gyroscopes to monitor our activities and heart rate. Now we have smartwatches which do all of that, play music, and they can answer messages. Smartphones and tablets have replaced maps, secretaries, alarm clocks, entertainment, and now they can control our homes, change the TV, the temperature, security, and lights all from your device. Our cars are even getting smarter with sensors to keep us safe. The Internet of Things is simply using technology to make human experience and simplify life. Hello everyone, welcome to Charlotte IoT, and um, I'm stoked to see another full audience, standing room only, awesome, so um, you guys have all heard the word about how we're all about technical presentations, we do, we're all about learning, and we like to um, help others with our learning, we do lots of workshops and hackathons, and then uh, presentations as well, and we're over 12,000, or 1,200, excuse me, 1,200 people, <laughs> soon to be 12,000. <laughs> And, and growing, and um, the reason Charlotte IoT totally rocks is this community here. We've got a board of some really awesome people who help the group in a lot of different ways, and our community is just amazing, and it all stems from these people here. Um, Graham, he's um, one of the first board members, and um, he helps with facilities and um, any odd little thing you need, he helps with. And um, Rob, he's our hands-on lab coordinator. I don't see him tonight, but um, he does a, lo a lot of the content, most of the content for our labs. And um, we do lots of things even outside of our meetings to, to do STEM activities and maker fairs and, and things like that. And um, Joseph, he's our streaming media wizard. And um, he also does all kinds of random things like um, t-shirt design, logo design. There's all kinds of amazing things he does. And Mike, he's our um, swag coordinator. And um, he's hooked us up with Haxter, who's been an amazing partner of ours. We'll talk more about Haxter in a little bit. But um, we all, we're no shortage of swag in this group. Every other group I know barely has anything to give away. And we usually have like all kinds of epic stuff. So thanks for all of that, Mike. And Christoph, he's our large event coordinator, helping with events we do like um, maker fairs and things like that. Uh, Glenn's our social media wizard. Um, he had to be out of town today. I'm going to send some uh, pictures to him and um, after I, he posts them on our, our accounts, if you guys could like them, that'd be really good. And Jeremy, we've got a whole bunch of slides on the Civic Hackathon stuff, but it's one of the most proud things that we're doing in Charlotte IoT that's just like totally amazing. And um, I mentioned that um, here's our uh, Facebook and Instagram accounts. Um, after uh, I send the stuff to Glenn, if you guys could, could love and like all those images, um, that'd be great. And we have our YouTube channel, and this is thanks to Joseph. And Joseph does this um, as a business, and he's like amazing. Check out how awesome it is. And then also, if you want to go back and review something, um, like if you didn't quite catch it the first time, you can go back and watch it as many times as you like, and, and it's really helpful for things like that. Really, really great that we stream them. And um, one thing that Mike does is if you put your email in the Meetup profile, Mike will send you a Slack invite. And we've got a very active channel. Um, one of the most active parts of the channel is on the Assist IoT area for the hackathons that we're doing for Civic Hackathons. But there's lots of other active things going on. And a lot of people in the group are doing some really, really sweet things. Um, people are posting things on Thread and making PCBs and, and asking for people to help test. So um, if you have questions, there's a whole bunch of senior members in our group. And Slack is a great place if you get stuck on something to, to ask some questions. And tonight, um, for our sponsors, we have um, Cypress, and um, I'll give them the mic in a little bit to talk about how awesome they are. But um, and we really appreciate Cypress coming in town. They're, they're coming all the way from two places, from Raleigh and Boston, so it's really sweet for them to come to our group. Um, my company, I've got a couple commercial slides for that. Um, Haxter IO, um, we've got slides for them too. Graham, I've got um, a slide for you. If you want to, um. so uh, welcome everybody. So I work here at SAP AV, and I get the wonderful privilege of running the 
really neat IoT platform called Oversee, and we just crossed a million devices actually that we that we have in our platform. So wow. it's been great to host this, and welcome and enjoy the evening. Yeah, congrats on over a million. It's like every meeting they have another hundred thousand devices. So, um, by the end of the year, it'll be two million. Um, Hackster IO is just completely incredible, and um, we've got four people in the group who are ambassadors, and they gave us Christmas presents, the Huzzah feather, which is really awesome. But um, we love them not only because of their Christmas presents, but they give us like gifts constantly, and um, we use them to do hackathons and things like that. But they also give us two hundred dollars a month. And we use that money to buy things for our civic hackathons and, and other type things. And if you guys could all um, give a thank you to Hackster IO from Charlotte IoT and show them some love, it's, it's always good. We keep the gravy train going. Oh, yeah, and um, uh, Mark and I did a project that uh, Mark wrote this really awesome article on, and it's now posted in Hackster. And Hackster's got millions of other projects. But none as cool as the one that Mark and I did. So check out the Alexa fog bubble machine one. It was really cool. And now a commercial for my company. Um, I started my company 14 years ago, a little over 14, and we're Logical Advantage. We do really cool technology projects, and we do really cool IoT projects. This is one we did for a manufacturer, and there's 3,000 of these spindles in the factory. And, um, for a prototype, we um, on, on 24 of these spindles, we're posting into Azure where we can um, see what's up and what's down. And we're making a PCB that we're going to roll out to the rest of the, the spindles. And um, we'll be able to do things like machine learning because um, we wrote the system for their work orders. We know what work they do on the machines, um, when they fail, and things like that. We can marry the data with our IoT data to make the predictions on um, you know, when they're going to fail next and they can schedule them on the off shift. But um, we, we do some really epic, fun IoT projects. And our business is um, getting ready to explode this year. So um, we're not quite hiring. We're waiting for some deals to close. And uh, I would love, though, um, you guys to get in contact with me because we'll be hiring a ton this year. And um, so let's just stay in contact. And um, we did a really cool project that um, Particle posted a case study on. And um, the, the case study is on the, the project I just, just mentioned. There's a, um, a special code. It's Logical 30. Um, we've done a lot of um, thing, workshops and things like that with Particle. And they're really good devices. Um, and like for Christmas this year, I made, um, I think it was probably five different things with Particle Photon. Um, my Christmas lights all talk to each other. Uh, there's, I've got ornaments that you can talk with Alexa. And, um, and my niece and I made a little light that she can talk to. We're just making things constantly, and we're using tools like uh, Jeremy wrote this Echo Bridge that it couldn't be any easier to, um, to, to write things that, with Particle Photon. And, and Cyprus, I believe that you guys made the P1 or the P0, That's our, the part on which is is the, uh, this here is the, the, the microcontroller. So it's pretty sweet. And um, I can't say enough like totally awesome things about Particle. And um, Logical 30, if you enter that on the website, you get the 30% promo code on their stuff. It brings the price down to like around $13 for the Photon. And they also have a um, cellular one. Um, I would buy like 10 of them while you can before the deal runs out. I usually buy 10 at a time. They're like totally awesome and fun, and they're like popcorn. They get, all of a sudden, they're all gone, and you have to buy more. <laughs> um, we've done a bunch of other smart city and other cool projects, but I've used up my talking time. I'm going to jump over them. And Jeremy, if you could talk about Assist IoT and the sweet things we're doing. So uh, we've, we've come up with a name for the work that we've been doing. It's called Assist IoT. And uh, the basic concept is this. We're going to use Internet of Things uh, technology to assist those people in need. Um, I will tell you we are looking for two more candidates um, to roll out uh, assistant devices for um, by summer. That's our goal. We want three by the, uh, by the end of summer. Um, so if you know somebody who's in need, who has some <coughs> kind of challenge that they could use voice-activated technology or um, you know, assistive technology, uh, let us know. Um, we're, like I said, we're looking for our next two candidates. Um, 
We, um, we're going to be meeting um, the 17th of February at uh, Lending Tree, um, just down here in Ballantyne. Um, they do a great job of putting us up, um, and uh, they take care of us with a little bit of pizza. Um, I work there. It's a great place to work. If you're looking for a job, we are hiring. Uh, just come find me. Um, but uh, this, uh, I, I can't, Dan said it, he's very proud of the project. I can't think of you know, anything I did last year that was, that was more fulfilling um, than providing somebody who uh, you know, had a, an inability to do you know, things like use a remote control for a TV, and here we are giving them voice-activated technology to control their TV, which was their biggest ask. Um, and it, to see that reaction from somebody, um, I don't know that there was anything much better last year, honestly. Um, we're looking for all people, all walks of life. We're looking for people who can think and event and look at process and, and talk about, you know, how we can, you know, make this better. Um, so we're not just looking for technical people. We're looking for writers. We're looking for idea makers. We're looking for people who can help us on this journey. Um, and it's more than just a technical journey. So um, if anyone's interested, uh, need some details or anything, let me know. Otherwise, we'll have it up on the, uh, the meetup group. Um, and uh, come and come out on the 17th and help us out. Be great. So one of the really epic things is um, we helped our second person over the holiday. Uh, ben, um, the, the person lives in Indianapolis where, where Ben um, lives. He, when he went home, he um, helped install some of the, the tech that we had developed, um, including a, um, we have the chili pad blanket that um, heats and cools. And it's Alexa controlled. We built the um, controls that we're still needing to refine them and, and make it better so we actually know the temperature. But we did basic controls where you can increase the temperature or decrease the temperature on the blanket as like the first iteration so we could get him something. And um, Mark, he built a lip sync um, 3D printed thing that you could sip and suck into that's just like totally incredible. And um, we're coming up with like new ideas and, and um, sometimes we leverage other people's ideas and sometimes we leverage commercial products, but all things to help other people and not just paraplegics and quadriplegics, but um, we're hoping to help all kinds of people, including veterans, senior people, anyone who could use um, any type of like help through IOT is kind of what our, our goal is with that. And um, we're also joining forces with um, Makerspace. And um, we had a couple of um, like impromptu hackathons last year. At, at the last minute, we're going to do more of those on Sundays at the Makerspace. And they're a 503C, which is really great because they can accept donations. And like, we're not even an entity. We're just like a bunch of cool people who get together and have pizza and, and meetings. But so they're like an entity that we can, they can take donations and we can make really cool things. And um, if you've never been to the um, Makerspace, it's on Tryon. It's really cool. They've got like tons of um, woodworking equipment and other equipment that's really, really neat. And um, something else, um, Inventables just gave us an X-carve. It's about a meter by a meter. And um, you can carve into wood. And it's going to be sitting at the Makerspace as soon as we um, get it set up there. But um, it's just really cool. Um, uh, you can make things like this clock and, and guitar, it's, um, or you can make a housing for an IoT type thing. Who knows what you, we can do with it, but um, uh, they saw us at the um, Maker Fair. Their booth was right next to ours, and how, how cool and engaged all of our members were. And um, he happens to be my neighbor, and it was just really cool, so he gave us one to the group. Um, just really excited about that. And next meeting will be epic, like um, all of the meetings, but um, next meeting is going to be a change of scenery. We're going to go to Inventus, and Inventus is a company that helps people make, make products, and they help like on the whole life cycle from design, prototyping, manufacturing. If you guys have an idea of like a really cool product to make, Inventus is a really good company to talk to. They can help you like get a Kickstarter going and, and things like that, and um, they've like the founder of the company has invented some really cool things like the the bowl of cereal that you can roll on the floor and it doesn't spill I forget what it's called but um, so they and he's like a cereal entrepreneur it'll be a really fun night so um, everyone uh, I'll post the new address on meetup and you won't want to miss it next next month 
And something else you won't want to miss is our very own Jeremy, who just spoke a little while ago. He's going to talk on uh, Alexa skills in Columbia, the, the open source Columbia meeting, and that's on, um, what's the date, April 17th. And I know, Kurt, you're from Columbia too. Um, they have, they're they're going to have a, a good conference, and uh, I think they're going to have five or six tracks. Um, you know anything more about it? So yeah, I, I didn't even know about it until I heard you were in it, and I was kind of bummed out I didn't find out about it in time to submit something myself. But you won't want to miss Jeremy. I've seen him do talks on Alexa, and it's like mind-blowing. And then I used his code for the Echo Photon Bridge. And it just and, worked. What's that? And it just worked. <laughs> yeah, it just worked. <laughs> and, and not only did it work, but it was just like dirt super Dirt easy, if that's the word, is amazing. And, and the same code we're using for our civic hackathons, it's, it's been really good. Um, also, um, is Dr. Um, what's her, Dr. Marguerite. Marguerite here? Um, Winthrop is doing a hackathon, and they're looking for cool folks like us to help mentor them. And it's two 24-hour events. And they're like from 4 p.m. to 4 p.m. the next day. Um, and I don't think that we have to stay the whole time, but I'm sure they would love it if we could. And if you guys are interested in helping them out, um, come see me and I'll, I'll get you in touch with her. But she also um, said she'd probably be coming late to the meeting. And if she comes to the meeting tonight, you can, you can talk with her. Um, but it'd be really cool if we can help the community. Um, and I, I mentioned to her through Meetup about our Civic Hackathon, so I'm hoping to rope in some students to maybe help out with that too. And our main event tonight, um, so David, um, he organized this event, and I'm not sure if you want to get up and, and talk about how awesome Cyprus is. Um, It'll speak for itself. Yeah, sweet. Um, <laughs> Ernie, I bumped into Ernie at the Riot event at All Things Open um, a few months back, and um, I mentioned to him that Cypress did a really cool talk that like everyone in the group raved about. It was a workshop, and I was, it's the only meeting of Charlotte IoT I haven't, I wasn't able to attend, I was out of town, but everyone talked about how awesome it was, and I like so bummed out that I missed it. And so when I bumped into Ernie at, at the riot, I asked if they could come down and um, talk to Charlotte IoT so I can see some of that goodness. Um, for myself, and so I'm really stoked to hear what, what they have to say, and, and then um, Chuck, um, he flew in from Boston, so I'm really stoked that you came all the way, and <laughs> for, for the, yeah, 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 so um, Cyprus acquired Broadcom, and he's from the Broadcom <coughs> side, and the IoT guru extraordinaire on the Broadcom side, so I can't wait to hear, you know, everything you have to say. And I really appreciate you guys coming and making us smarter tonight. So, thank you. What is the Internet of Things? Is it hardware, software, or both? Well, chances are you already have it in your pocket. It might be on your wrist. Recently popular are fitness bands with accelerometers and gyroscopes to monitor our activities and heart rate. Now we have smartwatches which do all of that, play music, and they can answer messages. Smartphones and tablets have replaced maps, secretaries, alarm clocks, entertainment, and now they can control our homes, change the TV, the temperature, security, and lights all from your device. Our cars are even getting smarter with sensors to keep us safe. The Internet of Things is simply using technology to mimic the human experience and simply. Hi everybody, uh, thanks, thanks for coming and it's great to be here, great to be back. Uh, it was, uh, the, the session that Dan mentioned uh, was probably a couple years ago, the, the one we did for Bluetooth. Uh, who was here for that? Anybody remember or remember me up here talking? Just a, just a couple of you guys? Well, it was really great. If you missed it, I'm uh, so, sorry, <laughs> but it, it was really awesome. So hopefully we can duplicate some of that today. Today is going to be a little bit different than what we did on the other one. And again, 
Uh, who am I? I'm Ernie Butterbo. I'm the field applications engineer for, for Cyprus, based out of Raleigh, and I cover the Carolinas plus a bunch of other states. Chuck Farrow with me. He'll be talking after I talk. Uh, again, he's a, uh, one of my counterparts uh, out of the Boston area. He's an FAE, and, but he specializes a little more in the IoT stuff. So it's great to have Chuck here uh, for all those really detailed and hard questions. Uh, we'll give those to, to Chuck. Um, but a lot of things have happened uh, even since I was here oh, a year and a half ago or so at, at Cyprus. Uh, if you know anything about Cyprus, you know, we were founded as a, as a memory company back in the early 80s. But you know, since then, we've really expanded uh, over time. You know, we have memories. We have uh, you know, not only SRAMs, but non-volatile memories. We have flash memories. We're big in USB, uh, microprocessors, and IoT. IoT is a big thing for us. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we acquired the IoT division of Broadcom. Okay, so I'm sure you guys have heard of Broadcom, and Broadcom's still there, and Broadcom still does Wi-Fi and a lot of the stuff they do. Broadcom still focuses, though, on like access points and those <coughs> kinds of things. The piece that we bought from Broadcom was the, the IoT portion, so it's really the devices that connect to the access points and you know, the devices you have in your hand, the stuff that you wear, um, the stuff that are, that's in cars, all of that kind of stuff, that's where we play. The really great benefit is Broadcom has a huge, huge market share for all those access points and we share the same DNA essentially for all the, the, the protocol and, and the, the silicon and the stuff that goes together so they all talk and you have you know, pretty good interoperability. So this is kind of a snapshot of um, what we were before, the stuff in blue is what we were with Cypress, and we had Bluetooth before, uh, and, and that's what we had talked about. We had a, a series of parts, processor parts, we call PSOC, programmable systems on a chip, uh, that also included Bluetooth. Well, when we picked up the Broadcom wireless stuff, that added to our portfolio Bluetooth. So we, the Bluetooth low energy that we had before, we added to it, we also added Bluetooth Classic to that. We added Zigbee, Thread, and then the big piece of it is Wi-Fi. So in all of those areas, all those wireless protocols that are typically used in IoT, we're now a very, very big player in that. Uh, just some of the things that you may have seen, you know, just in standard products lying around that you might have at home or, or somewhere else, we're in all of these. You know, there's so many different things that are out there that people want to put on, uh, you know, on the cloud, make access available to a lot of people or, or just be able to gather statistics or whatever the case may be. So, you know, something makes things easy, you know, push a button to order something. Uh, toothbrushes, you know, you see people putting toothbrushes, uh, making those, you know, having connectivity, for, you know, to the, to the, to the cloud. Uh, shoes, running shoes, wearables, wearables a big thing. Uh, so there's a, a lot of stuff in the world today where you guys know, you know, probably better than most, that people want to connect to, to the, the web. To make that easy, and what we've done, and what we've picked up from Broadcom, and what we're building on with all of our stuff, we have a whole ecosystem. And kind of in short, this ecosystem is called WICKED. So if you ever see that W-I-C-E-D, that stands for <laughs> WICKED, or we pronounce it WICKED. Uh, and when you first look at it, it says, what, what's this Weist thing? It, it's it pronounced Wicked. Um, and Wicked, a lot of times we'll refer to Wicked as really the software, the IDE that we use, or the tool chain that we use to uh, implement uh, some of the stuff. But in reality, Wicked is much bigger than that. It, it's the whole ecosystem. Not only does it um, include the, the tools that we talk about and the tools that we use, but it also includes modules, our module partners, and, and I'll show you in a couple of slides, we have a lot of partners that work with us to provide things to you to make your life easier on getting things into the cloud. Uh, it's also, uh, if you, you think about uh, Wicked, it, it's also support. We have a, a huge community support structure on our website, so if you need uh, information or if you have questions, you need answers, we have this whole area on our website that uh, where you can get answers, you, know, community. you can post questions on there and get answers. Uh, and then obviously we have application notes and a whole bunch of other uh, how-to guides. So that whole thing, that whole ecosystem, you can think of as, as wicked. 
the parts that we have, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, and what, what, I'm, what I want to do here is I'm just kind of setting the stage what we have in terms of some parts, what we have in terms of uh, modules, how all these things play together, and then Chuck's going to uh, pick up and talk more about the technology, mostly uh, fo uh, focusing on Wi-Fi and why you would pick one versus another and, and, and some of the aspects of, of Wi-Fi. So, you know, the, the idea here is to give you, you guys, a, you know, maybe a, a little more insight on what really goes on and how things interconnect and how, uh, you know, what, what some of the, the, the choices that you have when you're looking at, you know, some of the connectivity things. Um, when we talk about parts uh, in, in terms of wireless, you know, we have the Bluetooth parts, we have Wi-Fi parts. On the top of the screen there, you can see a couple of BLE-only MCUs. Uh, so the, 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 the 20736, 2037, those are parts that we have that are just Bluetooth only. You want to make a connection, you want to have a, a, a Bluetooth connect to your phone, those are the kind of parts that we have. Then we also have combo parts. These are Wi-Fi parts and Bluetooth parts all in one. A lot of times people will use Bluetooth maybe for some provisioning, maybe make the connection, set up your access point and that would enable your, your Wi-Fi connection. So those are combination parts, combo parts, and there's a bunch of those. And then we have parts that are Wi-Fi or Bluetooth that have a, another micro embedded into it. So it makes it very easy to give you a, a single chip system where you have a processor and your wireless connectivity all in one. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different choices and you see a lot of different parts and what's different between from one part to another part to another part might be single band, dual band, uh, you know, what kind of a protocol, is it B, G, N, that kind of thing. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. But again, we didn't want to make this a, a marketing presentation. We wanted more of a, a technology and, and share with you what, what's there. But we do want to give you an idea of when you're going to do something with a product, what do you have it at your disposal? Now, there's a whole bunch of questions that you have to ask yourself when you're, you're about to embark on a, a wireless design. There's a lot of um, areas where you have to worry about with wireless, right? Everybody knows about certifications, you know, FCC, and then there are all the other countries where you need certification. A lot of times you have, for Bluetooth, you can do chip down or you can do modules, okay? There's a lot of different companies that make modules for Bluetooth. We make modules for our Bluetooth parts. We have mo uh, partners that make modules for our Bluetooth parts. But again, you can still do a chip down and do your own certification. Wi-Fi is a very different beast. Wi-Fi is much more difficult to do certification. So you would uh, rarely, if ever, do a chip down design with a Wi-Fi part. You would almost always do a module. And because of that, we have a lot of different module partners, and I'll show you some, some of those in, in a minute. But so there's a lot of questions that you gotta ask yourself when you're, you're, you're doing a design. I, am I doing Bluetooth? Am I doing Wi-Fi? And what kind of expertise do I have in terms of the, the RF? You know, do I have uh, people that will, can do code? You know, what, what's my level of expertise? And that kind of drives where you would go and where you would end up with, you know, whether it's a chip design or module design, and if you're doing a module design, what module partner? Because many of the module partners have, I'll say, pros and cons. Some are stronger in certain areas, some are stronger in other areas. So that way it kind of match up to what you need for your particular design. Um, so we have module makers, uh, we have technology partners, and uh, a, a bunch of different, I'll say, value-added resellers where people will take these modules and they'll add other things on top of it, like maybe extra security, uh, or they'll make uh, things maybe a little easier to use for you, maybe a different command interface uh, between it just to make your connection easier. Um, this is a, a list of a, some of the, the partners that we have, and you'll recognize some of these names, and I'll, I'll point out a few of them. Uh, one of them, Dan mentioned earlier, Particle. Okay, so we're a partner with, with Particle. Particle uses our Wi-Fi chip on their module. So when you buy their module, they make it really, really easy. They have their own cloud. 
uh, but they're using our Wi-Fi part to make you know, the connection to whatever access point you have, and then they add that the extra logic around it to uh, make can, talking to their cloud easy, making updates over the air very easy. So that, that's a great, uh, easy way of getting something onto the web very, very quickly. So there's a case where you're using our part. You may not even know that you're using our part, but you're using it on that, that module. Okay, and again, particle is one of those, uh, kind of a, a full value kind of thing. Uh, electric imp is another one uh, similar to particle. Electric imp has a module, again, uses our part on there. But their claim to fame there is they add that extra level of security. If you want to make a connection to the, the, the cloud, but you want to make sure that that connection is secure and data going back and forth is very secure, that's what they do. They add that extra level of, of, of security to it. Um, other guys that are on there, Murata, they make modules. Now, it's really just a module that they do. You buy the module, and then you do your own uh, interface to that, you know, to whatever cloud that you want to do. You can uh, use that to talk to uh, Amazon Web Services, so you, AWS. You could do um, uh, the, the IBM cloud. You can do any of the clouds that are out there or your own server with a Murata. Another one that we use quite a bit uh, is one called Inventech Systems. Uh, they're, uh, they're a module maker. And again, they make a module, a variety of different modules. And what's really nice about the ones from there is not only can you use Wicked, our, our software, the IDE, to write code for that. They also have one that's preloaded to where you can talk to our module, their module with an AT command set. So if you want to get onto the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, making a connection, a Wi-Fi connection very quickly using AT command sets, that's a great way to go. Okay? But again, there's so many different module guys out there that whenever you're, you're embarking on a design, you kind of list, okay, what are the things that I want to do? Do I want uh, single band? Do I want dual band? Do I need this protocol? What, what is it that I need to do? And what do I need to, am I, what am I going to talk to? Am I talking to my own server, somebody else's cloud? And then that's where we work with you to find the right partner to match you up with them in terms of you know, what they offer, the kind of support they have, and what kind of products that they have. Okay. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck, and he's going to talk more about what's underneath, what's in the, the Wi-Fi aspects of it. My life. What is the Internet of Things? Is it hardware, software, or both? Well, chances are you already have it in your pocket. It might be on your wrist. Recently popular are fitness bands with accelerometers and gyroscopes to monitor our activities and heart rate. Now we have smartwatches which do all of that, play music, and they can answer messages. Smartphones and tablets have replaced maps, secretaries, alarm clocks, entertainment, and now they can control our homes, change the TV, the temperature, security, and lights all from your device. Our cars are even getting smarter with sensors to keep us safe. The Internet of Things is simply using technology to mimic the human experience and simplify life. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it'll teach me to come to Charlotte again. I was told I was going to do a couple of customer visits, and here I'm stuck doing live, live presentations. So. Uh, kind of bear with me here. Um, uh, as you've heard, I'm Chuck Farrow. I uh, just recently joined Cypress and actually spent uh, about 18 years at Texas Instruments selling their wireless products over there and uh, had an epiphany and wanted to go sell the best products, best wireless products, so I joined Cypress with the, um, with the uh, Broadcom Wicked um, radios. So that's how I ended up here. And I wanted to go through um, sort of some a decision process, if you're looking at Wi-Fi, is uh, people here looking, um, making those kinds of technology decisions at this point, or is it more higher level? There's, there's so many different aspects. Uh, I was going to kind of come in at a low, kind of a low level, looking at the Wi-Fi technologies and uh, give you guys an idea of what's, what's available and uh, some of the specifics uh, in, in there. So um, what we'll cover is... Uh, selecting an IoT architecture, 
Uh, I've got some Bluetooth Wi-Fi products we can look at. Um, and then the technology in terms, that's the fun stuff. So if you, get any, if you have any questions on the Wi-Fi, I know it's kind of ubiquitous at this point. Most people just plug it in and it works. But I kind of get a kick out of studying this, the particulars of it. Um, so feel free to ask. And uh, we'll look at 11AC. That's, does anybody know what that is? The latest, it's the latest. Wi-Fi. Right, the latest spec in Wi-Fi. Um, and that's the super speed. And believe it or not, there's AX coming. Uh, we'll see even higher, even higher speeds. But I'll give you an, I try to give you an idea of how, how they gain those speeds. When, <clears throat> when you're picking, um, when you're trying to design a product, a uh, connected product, there's uh, four kind of architectures that we look at that you have to decide on. Um, and I'll let you guys go through and read these. But essentially, um, you've got, uh, and it's module-based, just to take uh, the lead from Ernie, where you, um, the Wi-Fi chip gets sold on a module in most cases, and that, as he already went through, will get you um, a lot of benefit in terms of cost and time uh, to market. And <clears throat> so you can buy a module with the uh, MCU and the radio on it already, and you have an external host, so that's when you're adding connectivity to an existing system. If you've got the case in Architecture 2, you can, um, if your host, if you're doing a new design, you can think of this as a good way to get started if you can do all of your application on the same host that's running the Wi-Fi. There's also separate host and radio inside a module. And that gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of the host, but you still get the benefits of the, um, the certified module. And then you can just buy a radio uh, on a module and have a third party host external to the module. So those are the four architectures that we, that we cover. Uh, <clears throat> Oops. So this, this is the ecosystem again. I'm going to, we'll talk about um, a few things here. Mostly the, the Wicked software is, uh, is a key component. Now, has anybody in the room used Wicked? It's, okay, that's a, the guys, the engineering guys are going to be using this tool in the back room probably, developing all these uh, nice, nice applications. Uh, we put a lot of effort into the tool. Um, as well as the pieces around it. And, and Andy touched, uh, Ernie touched on some of those already. This is the uh, Wicked Studio 6.0. It's the latest release <coughs> that we have um, available. And it's a free download uh, on our website. And it, it brings together a lot of different things, uh, this IDE. The... Uh, <laughs> A quick way to think about it is the radios themselves, whether it's MCU on board or just the radio, has a lot of uh, ROM code, uh, Wi-Fi ROM code based on the part itself. And, and this tool, it allows you to set up the uh, APIs into that and access. So we wrap a lot of the complexity up um, around this, and this tool covers that up. Because the chips these days, um, they're not like microcontroller based, any microcontroller developers here? From, it's not, these generally aren't register based radios. There's multiple CPUs uh, on board, multiple buses, and a lot of that gets, all of that is hidden um, with ROM code, and there's only a handful of guys that, um, that know that stuff. So this is a more ge uh, general tool that allows everybody to access the power of a very complicated part. <clears throat> um, this is another way to slice the, our offerings. Uh, we have uh, it's more specific to the, the protocol. So there's uh, Wi-Fi only. Um, we have Wi-Fi with MCU built in. Uh, then we have the combo parts. Yeah, that's everything in one. And then we have the Bluetooth. Um, there's a variety of Bluetooth parts, com, um, dual mode or uh, BLE only.
This, is a, this was a, a real interesting slide. It came from our marketing folks. Uh, and, and the block in the middle is our competitors. I, we're not allowed to show that uh, too, too publicly, so I blocked it out. But needless to say, you can imagine it's kind of a sparse array in there. There's not any one company covers all of these protocols. And please read down this column. Uh, if there's anything you don't understand, I'd like to, um, I'd like to explain it. Um, and I'll go through a couple of, the, a couple of them here. Uh, two by two is two by two MIMO, multiple user, um, multiple output, uh, multiple input, multiple output. Um, it's if there's uh, more than one antenna that you can um, send data to. Question or? Um, and AC obviously is the latest spec. That's the highest um, throughput that you can get. Um, AC incorporates um, a lot of new features. 256 QAM. Yes, sir. What are some use cases for using the two by two? Um, if you want, if you need more throughput, uh, two by two, it actually sets up two different, is two antennas, and they can both be talking at the same time, so you're getting twice the data through. Uh, the spec allows up to eight, eight by eight, but that's going to be in the next wave. Uh, if any, if anyone follows the the Wi-Fi Alliance, they release. Uh, when a spec goes out, there's, um, um, there's required things you have to implement, and then there's optional. And right now, the AC spec is uh, required is 4x4, four four, or um, is 2x2, two two, and optional is 4x4. Four four. In the next wave, it's going to be 8x8x8. Uh, eight by, eight by eight. So, but there's a lot of debate. Um, that's the plan. They don't, it doesn't always work out the same because the marketplace dictates... Uh, most of the time how these specs get implemented because they can come up with a really expensive spec to implement but if you can't get it into silicon or it's too expensive you know too big or too expensive then it, it won't get and in, in the market if the customers don't want it then it won't get um, <clears throat> and there's some interesting things with BLE going on right now um, with the same some of the specs we're not sure they're going to get uh, in Bluetooth 5 um, which isn't for this presentation, but we'd be glad to talk offline on that. So anyway, that's a long answer. Um, it gives you more um, <coughs> spatial streams for transmitting. And if you get into multi-user MIMO, you can actually be doing... Um, this MIMO is actually point-to-point um, -point or device-to-device -device with multiple... You can actually divide it up. Multi-user MIMO allows you to send a stream on one antenna to this guy, one client, um, and then another one, another antenna sending to another, and up to four right now. So it's called spatial uh, diversification. They're just they're um, they're spread out in space in space. Any questions on this? We have a chip that will do any one of these. Um, and that's what that indicates over there. What's another interesting? Uh, so AC is new, great and new, but it's expensive. So there may not be a reason to go to AC in all cases. You may, if you can get away with lower throughput, uh, a little bit more power, you can stay on N. Um, and we'll see some graphs um, with the specific savings, time versus power, um, coming up. Good question. Uh, Ernie already covered these, so I won't go in. Just suffice it to say that we've got a lot of, a lot of great chips. Uh, they pay me money to say that, so I had to give that, put that out there. Uh, now we'll look at some of the terms yeah, in a little bit more detail, maybe, and feel free to, to hit me up um, on this. Um, I don't know. Some people don't care. It just, it just works. So. Um, like I said before, though, there's a lot of interesting things. The, the progression of this, I can't see my screen. I don't have my glasses on. So, <laughs> uh, but the ISM band, everybody knows we went to 5 gigahertz with N. It was optional. Now AC, it's only 5 gigahertz. Um, the interesting thing, though, is if you have an AC chip, it generally will do, be backwards compatible, so it can do both. 
anyway. And that's true of all the specs within the, the Wi-Fi uh, alliance. Um, the channel width is really, it's interesting. Um, it, it, 22 uh, went to 20 megahertz. They kind of standardized on that. And then there were multiples of that. So if you can imagine, you can get a um, certain amount of data, a certain amount of bandwidth in 20 megahertz. Well, if you double that, you can, the width, you can double the data rate through that channel. So you can see what we're getting by going up to 160. It's an 8x improvement in throughput. And if you do 8 by 8, you're getting another 8x factor improvement. And that's how you get those speeds bumping up uh, on, the, on the right, on the left over there. How often can you actually get the 256 or 1024 qualm? Yeah, you'd probably have to be over there at that, the end of that desk. Uh, well, I mean, I'm thinking, because we've, yeah. we've had a lot of demo failures here in both Bluetooth and right. Wi-Fi, and, and looking at the spectrum around here, it's really jammed up. Yeah, I, I just wonder, I mean, you've got to have ungodly sign to hit 1024 qualm. Yeah, no, there's a lot of things that have to, that have to be in place for it, for it to work. Um, yeah, if you go outside the room, it's not going to, it's, it's going to, the good news is it steps down. You don't have to um, do anything. But if you've got a, if you needed a, a high throughput connection, um, you know you've got to be. There's so many things that are killing you though in in the, in the space, right? Um, well, Baby the, monitors. yeah, you got the, the spectrum is so full now. I mean, the, we're lucky. The five gigahertz actually is. It, I don't know. It's, it's is it full or not? It's clearer, right? But <laughs> nothing else is in there. But um, yeah, there's a lot of things going against you in the 2.4 gigahertz space. Um, and I think I talk about it coming up. There's a back, you know, if there's a collision, it won't retrain. There's a random increasing back off. So it, every time you get a collision, it, it backs off again. So your throughput, you're getting killed on throughput. Yeah, but that's even if you've got a collision in, in the protocol, right? If you've just got random energy coming from every other goofy thing that used the unlicensed spectrum. Right. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, it's, you're, um, you're fighting a lot of different things. Um, okay, um, yeah, you can see um, just the last thing, the QAM, um, it's quadrature amplitude modulation. It's a really, I mean, guys dedicate their whole career to figuring this stuff out, right? I mean, it's, but um, it's essentially uh, amplitude and phase modulation built into one. Um, is, and does anybody know how many how many bits can be sent through 256 qualm at one one symbol period? If if you know the symbol period as well, then you can you can figure out these numbers at the end quite <coughs> very quickly. I have a a nice presentation on that, but we don't have time for that. I actually like giving that better, but. Um, it's 256 values in one symbol period is what you can send with 256 qualm. So it used to be a one or a zero. It used to be one bit. You know, you're sending a zero. Now you're sending um, one of 255. One of 256 values can go through. So it's quite a quite an improvement. And you can see the bump up with AX. It's going to be even you know another 4x improvement on that. So that's how they're getting those speeds. Those numbers, those are theoretical numbers, um, and you can do the math. I've done it on any one of these. It's, it's really, it's kind of neat, actually. Another term that we have, um, that we use when trying to help designers is single band um, versus dual band. Um, I already hit on it a little bit. It's just 2.4 versus 5, um, you know. Um, if you can get away with, well, I don't know, it's, if you can get away with, um, if your space is not that crowded, I guess, with other, other devices, uh, and you can stick with a sort of a cheaper radio, potentially, um, otherwise you're going to have to jump up to the uh, N or the a AC, which gets you the 5 gigahertz. What, what's the module price difference between single and dual band? Because it seems like all the, all the hobbyist devices on those are all single band. Yeah, because it's so well proven. Um, you know, it's um, 2.4. It's, you know, 
they've been out for a long time. You know. Just the chips have gotten better and cheaper and mass production. And yeah, um, yeah, we're forced. I mean, the customers force us to uh, sell it cheaper. <laughs> It's twice, it's the same, it's Moore's Law still, right? It's twice the capability, twice the speed for half the price. And I don't know how, I've always said, I, I probably make more money selling ice cream cones, or more margin selling ice cream cones than selling chips. I mean, we're, you know, it's in the pennies now. So let me just add oh. So when you talk about 2.4 single band, generally those modules are less expensive than the dual band. Right. Right. And, and it's, it's one of those things where what does your product need? You only need single band. So like we're talking about the, the particle board. That's a single band, 2.4 gigahertz, running D, G, or N. It uses our, one of our parts called the, the 43362. Okay? So that way they can come up with a fairly low cost uh, module along with the other guys. Now if you need uh, faster throughput or you need the dual band, then there's other parts and other modules that have the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz, and they may even go beyond uh, N, they may even be AC. And so if you have the dual band or you go to AC, generally those parts are a little more complicated, means a little more price, means the module's a little bit more pricey. So it's... Well, and, and as a percentage, I mean, I... I it's I generally not that much, right? Because, really? yeah, because you think about it, so we have the chip, but then there's the module. So the chip's a little more expensive. The stuff around it on the module is really the same. So if you look at a percentage-wise of the total module cost, it's just it's a small increment uh, for the total module cost, if you, if you can follow that. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, yeah. and it's just the hobbyist guys are always pushing because they're competing for that low cost, so they're only doing the single band. Okay, right. makes sense. Yeah, and it, it may be you only want the single band. You don't care about the, you know, the 5 gigahertz for your, for your application. Yeah. Yeah, this, I mean, over time, too, things get easier, right? There's always more pain with the more cutting-edge technology. You're trying to get the tools, get everything up to speed, so um, N can be, um, you know, single band can be a good place to start. Okay, antenna diversity. Um, this... This, uh, this is a, um, it's two antennas. It's a little different than MIMO. It allows you to pick the best antenna for reception. So you have to be, there's an algorithm in that's looking at both antennas, trying to figure out the, what the, uh, has the best reception, RSS or RSSI. And it will uh, switch and try to avoid some of these the fading problem that happens in RF where you're getting uh, multipath, you know, the same signal, it's just out of phase coming into antenna. So it'll try to pick the better antenna, whoever has the least amount of fading, if that makes sense, or, or no fading. At, at Wi-Fi, at both 2.4 and 5.0, how, how much diversity do you need in the antennas to have one in fade and one out? Because I know at cellular it's several meters, but that's down at 800. Yeah, th th no, this is like, um, uh, probably the more the better, but I don't, I don't know what, that's a good question. I'm not sure what the minimum would be, but it's, um, I mean, routers have them, you know, they're, you know, six inches apart. Yeah, I was wondering if that's, yeah. that speed. I don't know. It's, it, all the processing is done with DSPs. There's DSPs on these parts now, and the, the, the signal, they, all that, the qualm is all done, pre-generated with the DSP, and it's decoded the same way. It's, there's not a bunch of analog parts um, doing that. So you can get precise, well, the signal to noise ratio still matters, but um, yeah. <clears throat> so this is a good feature that we have. This is, um, you see Cypress down there. Again, I, my, they sign my paycheck. So we, um, we have guys, uh, Broadcom guys that came over that are really sharp that um, developed this. <coughs> Coexistence, another major problem. Um, we already talked about this a little bit, the um, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, they're both in, in 2.4 um, band. So you're gonna have a lot of collisions along with the other devices that we just recently mentioned. Um, and you're gonna get, again, there's, if there's collisions, in there, you're going to get back-offs, and it's, it can get real, real messy on your throughput number. If 
that's important to you. If you have to co-locate Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, um, you can, the only thing you can do is TDM, time uh, slice it, time division multiplexing. Uh, or we have uh, an algorithm, PTA, um, packet traffic arbitrators uh, built into the parts that help with this. If you think about it, we actually have um, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on the same chip. So by definition, it's on the same board. Uh, another, I think, kind of spoiled the fun of this one a little bit already, but you can see the diagram um, of how that can work. Um, the two by two, it's an antenna, two antenna times two, right, on two by two. So you've got two, two streams versus one. SISO is just is one, essentially one by one. <coughs> and the, the, you can see the, the antennas on the, the router on the left. Um, that's one of the limitations I was saying before. Would you ever see eight antennas on a router like that to get eight by eight, right? The, the guys are going to go crazy. Like the price is going to go up by some amount, and they're going to say no. We're, so even though this, it's in the spec, it may never get implemented. So that's... Um, but you can see we're up to 4x4 four four, uh, right now. And the other interesting thing on the numbers before that I neglected to mention, that throughput is actually at that router. Well, if it had eight antennas in the theoretical, that 10 gigahertz um, or t 10 gigabits per second would be inside that router, not each. You can't have a device that's communicating with that um, having the same throughput. Sir. Are, are there any easy hacks we could do to our access points at home to make the antennas stronger? <laughs> yeah, that's, I wish I was smarter and could answer that. Uh, I, yeah, I just got an Alexa. That's like how tech, <laughs> or not, a, yes, uh, Echo. Mm -hmm. um, you can, there, I know that you can, um, what do they call that, root the router so you can, you can reflash them with, you know, rogue. WRT, open, open WRT. And yeah, and this, and you can yeah, take over um, and make it do more funky things. I've not done that. I, I'm not sure. But you can't, like, put on bigger antennas or things like that that'll... No, the wavelength match. Points. Yeah. It, uh, it depends on the, on the chips that are amplifying the... Exactly. I was thinking you could, in theory, you could put on an amplifying antenna, but... I don't know that you would be then, uh, you'd have the U.S. government on your case, <laughs> potentially. Uh, <laughs> but. Only the FCC is driving down your street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't want that. Uh, but in theory, you could, but that's, um, I know. You, I, a neat trick I figured out was um, probably a rookie, rookie mistake. You can actually get another router, the same router, and you can have them with the same SSID, and if you sp separate them spatially, you, you will connect your device, in your house, say, it, your device will connect to whichever one is, is stronger. So that's a real simple, and you can even, well, it's actually a little more complicated. You gotta, you gotta connect them. I had wired my house so I could wire them together through the Ethernet port so it knew, and one of them was not. I turned off DHCP so it wasn't giving out. Um, it wasn't giving out um, IP addresses. It, even though it was on the one that was off, DHCP, it would actually route through the cable to DHCP to get the IP. But it was a different, completely different connection. But that's fairly common. You can read about that on the internet. All right. Any other questions? I got a question. Sure. Has Cypress done anything with the ultra-low power modes of Wi-Fi where the Ooh. device is asymmetrically basically tapped into the, the Wi-Fi and absorbing energy from it and utilizing less energy and re retransmission? You know, so like energy harvesting? Well, and it doesn't even have to be energy harvesting as long as the device can be in an ultra-low power mode. So it has to, it, the uh, receiving end has to do more of the work for the devices? Hmm. Yeah, that's, 
I'm not sure specifically. Um, I do know one of our new radios, we did uh, Wi-Fi only, uh, 43012. We can be in a connection um, at one milliamp. Uh, no data, right? Well, I think you're talking about sending data, possibly. Well, it sends data back on, a, on basically the router acts as a arbiter and it talks to each individual device and it quiets the network. It acts oh. like a master slave yeah. and it quiets the network for the device to transmit on a timeshare basis. Yeah, I think you may be talking about um, uh, DTIM 3 or 4. <coughs> they, you can turn off the beacon. You can say ignore X amount of beacons and still stay in the connection. Um, yeah, that has to be coordinated between the, the um, you know, the router and the, and the device. Um, so you can ignore, because otherwise, if you don't respond to the beacon, you're going to get dropped um, every beacon, unless you do this coordination to save. And that's a way that you can save, because you can, now your device can go to sleep, which I yeah. think is kind of what you're asking. And that's, yeah, we... Well, so a lot of us are using Bluetooth to go low power. Yeah. And um, mesh especially because that allows you to extend the range. <coughs> what people would really want, and the latest Bluetooth spe spec helps a lot because it like doubled the range for, for the Bluetooth for, yeah. and remained low power. But people would like the Wi-Fi range on their device and still be able to talk to their hub, their, their router from, you know, let's say their, the edge of their property or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, they um, they do a that's with coding. They got the extra range with coding on Bluetooth, and, and Wi-Fi had that built in already. You just send more bits, you know, to get the, and then you re, um, you unencode it, and you can correct on the other end. Error correcting, yeah. Yeah, but the problem is you end up sending that. That's one of the I mentioned that earlier. The, the Bluetooth. That's one of the Bluetooth specs that probably will almost never get implemented. The phone guys are never going to put it in their phone because. It takes away from the battery, so they're they're probably not going to have the low the the, the long range Bluetooth um, in the phone, and therefore it will probably w will not get adopted elsewhere because it has to start at the phone. If, if it's not in the phone, nobody's going to do it. What is this when it turns up technology wise? That's interesting. So I thought it was already in the phone. I, 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 I heard a Nordic pitch, so I thought it was already being adopted. It is. It's been ratified, in fact. Last summer it was ratified. It hasn't even been a year yet. Five yeah, but I mean, I, I, they, I thought they made a statement that the, the phone guys were picking it up. So. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, we can all say that, but who knows? I mean, it's, right. and they could. I'm not trying to say they won't. I'm just, if you follow the logic, it, it kind of doesn't seem like they will. That's, that's all. So remember um, one thing for Bluetooth, uh, whether it's you know, 4.1 or 4.2 or 5.0, all those features, those great features that you hear about in Bluetooth 5.0 that are coming and that are going to be there, they're all optional. Okay, so you can have just one feature and you say, I'm Bluetooth 5.0 compatible. Well, you are, but all the other options were uh, options, right? So they're not implemented, but you're still 5.0. Uh, and things like the long range, that's, that's a feature that many or most have not implemented. Well, if any, so right. the other thing that mitigates, though, what you're saying is that people expect the phone to be the hub, and that's not the case for IoT. We're going to have a Bluetooth hub. The phone will just be a device on it, and we'll work in the mesh. So it, it'll, it'll come in. Actually, it doesn't have to work in the mesh. It will just connect to the hub and uh, do uh, a, a transport. So yeah. you'll be able to interact with your IoT devices that way. Yeah, and also keep a lot of those features of 5.0 kind of separate from the mesh stuff, too, because they don't necessarily go hand in hand, right? Because there's the mesh is a, a different st uh, stack that runs on top of the other stack, but doesn't necessarily take advantage of all those other options, right, that, that are well, in there. Well, like, it right? seems like a trade-off. Like, if you have the mesh, you don't necessarily need the long extension from 5.0, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, because you would never take advantage of them because you never enter data. You're always doing advertisement, essentially, right? 
so yeah, there's a lot of things. But keep, but again, going back to that one about, about options, about extended range or you know, longer packets or this feature or that feature, it's, it's, um, it's very device dependent. And which device adopts which piece, you have to really look close. Is, is that something that you need in your product? Right? Do you, do you need the, the one megabit versus the two megabit um, phi? And that's usually one that, that, that comes into play when somebody says they have 5.0. But you need the extended range. A lot of people aren't implementing the extended range because you can just use a PA. Right? Um, and then there are the, some of the other features that are, are, are in there. Again, do you really need those features uh, for the Bluetooth, that, for the product that you're implementing? Do you really need those features? Do you care about those features? If the answer is no, but I just want to be 5.0 because that's a marketing thing, well, you know, that, that, that's another story. But again, you got to really look at what features you really want and does the chip that you're going to target have them. Okay. That, well, that's right. And to Ernie's point uh, earlier, that's a, you can do that. You can claim 5.0 compliance and not have the long range feature in your, in your Bluetooth product. So that the, the SIG sets that up kind of, depending how you're looking at it, nicely <laughs> in a way. But it's bad when you're trying to sell, sell up by feature. <laughs> OK, thanks for good questions. Um, I spoiled the fun on this one as well. The multi-user, um, uh, single-user MIMO versus multi-user MIMO. You just, it's a direct multiplier. You know, you can get. Uh, we're only showing two there, but in theory, for it, you can get, um, you could have eight. If they were separated spatially, you could have eight different streams um, on the multi-user MIMO maximum. Uh, and this, this is another uh, fairly new feature to me, uh, being here at Cyprus. Um, it's the real simultaneous dual band. So we can actually be transmitting in both spectrums at the same time. So the graph on the right over there, um, data versus time, you're actually adding, um, the data rate gets added on top because they're both, you're using both uh, antennas at the same time. Um, what else on that? Yeah, the, it, it's, um, Right, the technology here, it's, it's complicated because you can see you have to have two, in order to do that, you have to have two separate radios, FIs, two radio chains in, inside the chip. <coughs> so it's, um, it takes a bit of extra, extra power to, to implement this, this feature. Oh, oh question. Yeah, so if you've got one access point, and then a thousand IoT devices that are sending really quick, short messages. <clears throat> Can you do that off one access point, or are you going to have to have a whole bunch of access points to support all those devices? Um, well, yeah, it depends. So it's short messages. Um, how often? I think is it not that often? Yes, yeah, every minute or so. Yeah, you could. You could just. Um, you could connect. Well, you have to make a choice. Do you want to stay in the connection or not? Um, but I, that's a good question. I'm not sure how they limit. This, there's got to be a maximum number of connections that you can have, just memory-wise, space-wise. So you'd have to be breaking the connection for all of them. And then at some point, right, you're going to come into a latency problem. That there's just not enough time to get all of those connections done and data transferred. The other thing you have to really worry about there, Dan, is somebody deciding to uh, use something to synchronize things. Because we've seen, in my, in my cellular wireless day, there were devices that were synchronized to clocks. Developers thought that'd be a great idea to have, yeah. have the, actually the Palm, the Palm device. They all came online at 8 a.m. all yeah, the time. Yeah, so they all tried to connect at the yeah. same time. GPS synchronous timed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> At eight, we had 10,000 devices turn on hmm. uh, in, this, in the same fraction of a second. So when you get into stuff like that, you got to be careful, too. Hmm. Random has to be, you have to be truly random when you're playing a statistical game, so. 
Yeah, that's a good. That'd be a good case study. I don't know if I've seen that, and uh, I, can, I can follow up with you on that and see how that. See if we've done anything on multiple. You know, many sensors. <laughs> the one. Yeah, this is the, uh, the beam forming. Again, it's, you know, guys, they did probably dedicate their careers to figuring this stuff out. Uh, but you're, you're essentially manipulating um, the, the phi and, and the energy going into it to, um, to focus the energy in a certain direction out of the antenna. All right, sorry, it's multiple antennas. So the, uh, the resulting signal is, is focused in one direction from those, in this case, four antennas. And you, get, you can see the little bit of gain that you get um, when you do that. And that, this is, again, needed for, uh, we went through this before, the multi-user MIMO, for instance, when you have spatially diverse devices, you need to form the beam towards that direction. Um, this, this was an interesting feature. This was an optional feature in N. Uh, they, um, but you had to implement it yourself. So nobody, <laughs> everybody did it different. So it basically wasn't adopted in N. In AC, they standardized a specific way to do it. Uh, and so we, um, we just implement that because there's some, I don't know if it says it up there, but there's some housekeeping packets that have to be sent with some measurements to figure out um, where you are, you know. Uh, this, I debated on this graph, but this actually does show some interesting stuff. Smaller is lo better, lower is better. Um, it's power consumption by technologies. I don't know, can you read the what that says, the AC, 11 AC, 80 megahertz in that column. So this, remember that um, the wider the channel, the more data you get through it. So that's less time on the air, hence less power that you're burning. And that's why we think the AC is, is a good choice going for uh, IoT products, uh, just for battery purposes. Um, but that's a trade-off, right? As we said earlier, cost. AC is going to be a little bit more money, um, but as Ernie said, it's not appreciably more. Um, and we compare it to BLE also, because that's a, that's a common technology for, for IoT, right, low power. Um, but you can see it, it's so slow, you're, you're on for so long to send that 10, 10K of, 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 um, of data. What, what's, sorry, what's the energy unit? Is it microjoules? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can read it? I can't even read it. I can't read it here, that's for sure. Uh -huh. there's, uh, there's just something terribly wrong with that picture. I oh. mean, I... <laughs> In a good way you, or a bad you, way? It's okay. Well, okay. I mean, I, I'm a normal skeptic. But I look at that picture and what you've done with BLE compared to Wi-Fi, and um, it just rings false to me. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll do some looking to try and figure out, but it looks like you've got a basic uh, AC Wi-Fi mode, maybe one-sixth of BLE for 10K of data. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fair. It doesn't seem right at all because I, I can't imagine people stream music on their on their BLE all day. They have headsets and they're they they have their wife their Bluetooth uh, speakers out at their swimming but, pool. Yeah. But they're receiving. Yeah. yeah. They're receiving much more than they're sending. Yeah, and that's Bluetooth. Which, this is BLE only. Yeah, that's that's transmitting. Yeah. When you're when you're actually radiating power. That's a lot of current in an electrical device. When you're receiving it and transforming it into audio locally, it's not, and you're, all you're transmitting is enough to hold session. Yeah, we, I mean, I can show you an audio receiving Bluetooth um, demo. No, no, no. It's six, six milliamps receiving full, it's a sync, uh, A2DP sync. 
So the, the parts can be pretty low. But this, remember, this is BLE. This is not Bluetooth Classic. Um, so you remember, you can't, um, your, your connection interval, you know, we could have set the connection interval. This is, could, you know, could have been. Well, that's what I mean. The LE in BLE stands for low energy. Right. <laughs> so well, you're saying. For all the other terms. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not transmitting. I, I, I know. I can't really defend this slide too much. Okay. I didn't, uh, I didn't make it. Uh, and who knows? They could have used an old. The, the other thing that we're fighting here is uh, technology. Like the older BLE radios are two, three times the power um, consumption of a new, a new radio. And even, I even mentioned the Wi-Fi. Like our Wi-Fi chip now can be in a connection at one milliamp. That's unheard of, right? It keeps <coughs> the connection alive with, a, with a, an access point. Um, hmm. So, you know, who knows what they actually did here. I, 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 not, I won't argue the uh, defend these numbers, but I think it's. Uh, you get the, 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 like, uh, the time the transmitter or receive is on. When you think about AC, where we're dealing with literally gigabits, you know, you're dealing with only a few microseconds where the actual transmitter receive is on. Now, the, in actual application, as you make the connection to an access point, things of that sort, you know, you're going to see probably more, you know, significantly yeah. more power. But, the actual transmitting of the data happens so quickly as opposed to BLE, which, you know, and a lot of times, even though BLE can hit, you know, one megabits per second, a lot of times these are the things that limit it to about 30 to 40 kilobits per second. So that transmitter is on maybe for a whole second versus just a few microseconds in AC. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Paul. The, we don't know what the connection interval was, um, you know. But you're right. BLE, we traditionally think about, I can run BLE on a coin cell. Or you don't think about that. I can, I can run BLE on, you know, I can't run Wi-Fi on a coin cell. Yeah, another, right. Another good way to think of this is BLE is not designed to stream 10 kilobytes of data either. It's, it's t you come up and send a few bytes, right? The temperature or whatever. When, they, there's no audio right now. I, I know they're working on it in the next, LEA is coming maybe in six the SIG is working on that, but right now there's no audio over Bluetooth, BLE. Um, you can do some voice control, there's um, remote controls, um, voice commanding, but it's packets, you know, it's sentences. They're, they're not streaming audio over Bluetooth, uh, BLE. I don't have any contrary evidence. All I'm doing is raising the question. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'm not Seems really. Seems highly suspicious. I, I think, Paul, <laughs> there's, but there's the answer right there. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, whatever combination of chips they had that's. Um, you raise a fair point, though. I, don't, I, I wonder what we were. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so, it's very uh, subjective is right, but you can set that, you, can ch you could change that just by changing the connection interval. Yeah. So. Um, for, that, for those to happen, it's got to be running at full, like, ideal connections. And as you alluded to, it doesn't yeah, happen very often. You get a boy happen. So, right. uh, you know, it's like, I'd be very interested to see what percentage of the time is, what you know, 11 AC, 80 megahertz actually going to be, it's how, how often is it going to be running at 20 megahertz or far, far less? All right. I, I know my one at home. But, uh, <laughs> it's supposed to be dual band. Have a better chance of getting data through in a saturated network than Wi-Fi anyways. B, uh, BLEs, Will, is that? that? Doesn't BLE have a better chance of getting data through? In a congested wireless well, it hops, it hops the channels yeah. and it looks for blank space. Right. And so it does a lot of things that Wi-Fi doesn't. Right. Wi-Fi stays on the channel. It's got a lot of sideband. Right. So it's, so it's a wider it's, channel. It's, too, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a big pig bandwidth wise. Right. And then so Bluetooth hops between them looking for low energy on the frequencies. Yeah. And uh, so right. this is, it, you know. It's surprising. There's a, there's a lot of settings. There's a lot of there's a lot of settings and things in there. Like I said, it's that's probably assuming errorless transmission and right a lot of other things. It's in the Faraday cage. It's like yeah, the size of the packet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's using extended packet because you can send 255 bytes now in a Bluetooth packet. I, we don't know if it's only sending the um, you know the four, 38 bytes or whatever. 
of the, the smaller frame, it's, it's going to send a lot more frames, too. So I don't see any little stars or, or whatever on your sheet, either. <laughs> and, or like a, a tiny little one or two, two with a, then a tinier, even tinier footnote. I know. So, okay. It's actually, if you, look, if, if you look really close, it's actually that. No. <laughs> it's really tiny. Well, that's why, that's why none of us are in marketing. I mean, but, you know, but, but I think, I mean, in the end, though, the point is it's something you got to take into consideration and actually look at it, right? Just because Bluetooth markets it as low energy doesn't mean it really yeah. is in, a, yeah. in an energy consumption yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, you got to look at it for your application and actually do some testing right. and, and yeah. figure it, out in your environment and what's going to go on. That's kind of the point of this, right? We're kind of pushing. We want to make sure you're looking at Wi-Fi for these um, low power nodes too. If it's the capability, if you need the uh, capability of the protocol, higher throughput, you know, uh, more data, you know, we want you to consider uh, Wi-Fi now because we have that low power Wi-Fi chips. That's and that that leads us into the. It's always better than soup cans. Yeah. Um, soup cans don't get a lot of interference though. And this, this is my last slide, and then I'll, you guys are going to like, ask some more questions. Or, or, but Ernie can answer them this time. Uh, uh, I, I won't go through all this, but just it's a snapshot. I'm sure it'll be captured. If there's any questions on any of these radios, uh, the latest ones, the low power one that I mentioned, um, is the 43012. That's you know we can we can be in a connection at one one milliamp, as I said. You know no data. If you're going to send data, that's going to cost you more, but. Uh, it's there. Um, the um, and you can see how it breaks down. That's a that's a kind of a dual band, a, a dual mode radio. Um, we've got others all throughout the um, the feature set. Um, there. So that's it for me. If any other questions, I checked the Samsung Galaxy A. Even though it has five O support. Um, supposedly, it only has support for the two megabits. It does not have support for long range. So that's kind of like what Ernie was saying: is that 5.0 is really kind of a list of options you can have. <laughs> now, whether or not the radio and that, can and that's, support long range, but right now it doesn't. So that's. Yeah, that's why Ernie picked that spec because that's the one, that, the two megabits per second five. We have, we have that feature in our 5.0 Bluetooth radios. You got, oh, okay. Uh, anything with mesh? Yes. Bluetooth mesh? Yeah. Bluetooth mesh or yeah. Wi Fi mesh? Uh, or Zigbee. I mean, also. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. What, yes. What's, what's Wi Fi mesh? Yes and yes. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there is a Wi Fi mesh. I think it was born out of the audio, some, the audio space. Um, we have that uh, as well, but the latest and greatest is Bluetooth mesh. Um, I think I mentioned that before, the summer, this past summer, the, the SIG ratified. And as Ernie alluded to it, it's not really part of the core spec. It's a profile on top of the core spec. So it, could, it was added to... Um, um, That's going to gonna be kind of tricky, isn't it? Bluetooth doesn't have a particularly long range to try and mesh that is going to be... Well, it's... Yeah, it, well... First, yeah, you don't really need the long range for the mesh, right? Because... In fact, the, the mesh, there's two kinds of meshes. In, in, in well, I mean, your points are going to have to be awful close together. Well, there's, there's the flood mesh, and then there's the routed mesh. And what we're talking about today is what Stratify is called the flood mesh. And what okay. the flood mesh does is it just it uses the advertisement channels that, that's on VLE. And it's only using those, not even using the data channels. It's just using the three advertisement channels and sending the data out over there. So the whole point hmm. with the mesh is you get your long range by hopping from one place to another place to another place so that your closest neighbor isn't out of range. It's still within, you know, whatever it is, 30, 50 meters or something like that. What kind of devices are you seeing that being, you know, or t is that being targeted towards or? Lighting, lighting's a big thing. Okay. Yeah. Right, so you have, a, you have a switch here, you have light bulbs and stuff. Generally, there's a lot of power associated with them, right? You're not sure. necessarily running on batteries. Now there is provisions in the mesh, uh, yeah. hopefully it's still there, yeah. where you, you have a kind of a, like a, a surrogate, um, where let's say you have your IoT device that's very, very low power, right? So it kind of wants to be off. So it can't be listening all the time. So you have kind of a surrogate that's kind of sitting there and you can talk to that surrogate. And then when you wake up, 
it can pass you <coughs> the, 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 yeah. the data, okay? okay. Uh, because mesh and low power don't necessarily go hand in hand. They're kind of competing things. So a lot of people will say, I want mesh to get what I want to do. Other people say, just give me long range because I really just care about getting farther away. Sure. Okay. But in terms of things like lighting, uh, you, you have plenty of power. You have the fixtures. You have every you know, power at all the places. It's so how, how far apart would your points need to be? Or could they be, I suppose is the right word. Um, mesh. Well, just within normal range of what you would have with Bluetooth today, right? Which, how far is your, your range for advertising today? It kind of depends <coughs> on your, your antenna, you know, what kind of antenna do you have. But, you know, we generally talk about 30 to, to 50 meters or something like that, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's 100 feet, 200 yeah. feet. Yeah, that's, that's pretty compelling. Yeah. And again, it all depends. You know, you're in a room, you know, are the obstructions, are you outside, are you close to the ground? Yeah, oh, yeah. metal all around you, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, naturally. Right. Right. Um, yep. Okay, so that could even work in, you know, like an industrial fluorescent or LED application at up and at it, you know. Exactly like right. Now, we, we do, um, it, coming back to the lighting thing, uh, I know I have a couple customers that, that do lighting in greenhouses, and these things can be football field oh, lengths, long. right? Bit, for sure. You know, big places. Uh, rather than mesh, they opted for long range. Hmm. Okay, and be able to talk to the farthest point from the closest point because that's they said okay to me or to them it was simpler to implement than trying to use the mesh and the long range also gave them extended temperature because yeah. lights get hot you know <laughs> greenhouses get hot so that's yeah. you know again system trade off what makes sense for your system yeah hey guys there's um, oh. like three different IDEs uh, for the platform, for your hardware platform, a, a Weiss Studio, Weiss Smart, and Weiss Wi-Fi? Yeah, Is so that I, correct? Is that yeah, it depends. Um, it's, it's a complicated story, but essentially the older ones have all been, I won't say deprecated, but yeah, if you're this, the, there's some older radios that you need to use the older Wicked platforms on, and, but coming forward, uh, Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi, Wicked 6.0 Studio is going to cover okay. all of the radios that we're going to the mar going to market with. Um, so if you install Studio, you'll cover all the devices. Yeah, if you get 6.01, I believe is the latest um, release. That'll have all the the um, all the radio. Now there, you're going to see if you do a Google, you're going to find other radios that that Cypress or Broadcom had that are out there. But we're not bringing everything to market, if you know what I mean, is to have EVMs and <coughs> examples in, in studio, be able to click, you know, build and load. It's a lot of effort to get that to that point. Sure. And so we're trying to pare back. If you want to buy a million or two or well, I should say 10 million units, I could probably get you anything. But you know what I mean? If you're in that sub, you know, if you're less than 10 million, yeah. you're probably going to have to be using the, the studio is probably what you want to install just to learn. Yeah, yeah, you should, it, and it's it's a pretty good tool. There's there's a lot of documentation. The doc folder is um, describes the demos. Um, yeah, but you can learn a lot. Say a couple of things about, about Wicked um, as we we're talking. Some things that kind of come to mind. First, in terms of uh, for, for Wicked, we will have a training session for Wicked. We internally we do a training session. We do a two day training session for Wicked Wi-Fi, and we call it you know. Wi-Fi or Wicked 101, and it's a pretty intense kind of thing that we do internally. Uh, we're also we're going to have that on uh, our web at, at some point, where it'll be recorded, and then you can you know, watch it and, and learn Wicked and what it, it's all about. If you're familiar with Eclipse, if you're comfortable with Eclipse, yeah. <laughs> Wicked will be no problem. It'll be pretty easy to you. That's it's really an Eclipse-based thing. Uh, I want to come back to what Dan was talking about with Particle. Wicket, if you're doing one of the modules, let's say you're getting a, a module from Murata, Inventec, or some of the other ones, and you have that module, you're going to use Wicket, and you're going to be very much in control of how that module and how that processor on that module is running. Because you're, you're writing Wicket, it, it has API in there to talk to the radio, and you're, you're getting data back and forth, but the stuff that goes around it, you're in full control over that. Taking a step back, Again, with the Inventec, they also had the AT command set where they had used Wicked to write 
code that's on the processor on that module and you talk to that module over that AT command set so you don't have to uh, know Wicked or even open up Wicked. In that case, you just pick up that module and off you're rolling. Particle is another example of something similar to that. They took a slightly different approach. Again, they would have used Wicked because they're using one of our parts with a, a processor on their module. You never see Wicked. You never touch Wicked. When all the stuff that you had done with Particle, you probably never even knew that Wicked existed. Yeah. Right? Uh, so what they did was they used Wicked to talk to our part and they integrated that into the processor it's on chip. And then what's uh, exposed to you is really just their IDE that, uh, I'll say it's Arduino-like in terms of writing C code. And then that goes on top of the Wicked that's running on the module, right? But it's, it's, you're, you're in control of everything other than that Wi-Fi. And you're talking to their stuff through their APIs. Okay. So when you talk about Wicked, uh, it'll come back to, from a system perspective, what do you need to do? What do you want to do? What kind of expertise? How much time do you want to put into it? You know, that kind of stuff. For what module makes sense? And then whatever module makes sense to use, then it'd be Wicked, AT command set, something more like Particle. Okay. So, but, but Wicked's a great tool, great, very, very powerful tool. You can do a lot of stuff with it. Uh, th it's a good point. Um, some of our module providers will even, if you have a protocol in mind that you want to have implement yourself, simple or complex, <coughs> that masks Wicked, it's the same concept, a custom protocol on top of Wicked. Just, yes. <coughs> For those looking to get into VLE and stuff, um, what kind of tools are you looking at as far as like sniffers and stuff like that that you guys have seen that have really helped in uh, development? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, we actually have um, sniffing uh, a dongle that in a, a Sci Smart we call yeah, it. Yeah, it's not really a sniffer though. It's really. Uh, That's true. You yeah. can you have you can uh, well you can scan and see. Um, um, you're really kind of stuck buying a um, a, a actual sniffer because even like we, when I was at TI, we had a, a dongle that it was a in the packet sniffer was the software that ran, but it would only see. If you know how BLE works, it's, it advertises simultaneously or sequentially in three channels, right? Three advertising channels. The sniffer would only see one of them. So, because it couldn't be on more than one channel at once. And you, you couldn't, you had to actually capture the um, connection parameter frame to know which channels the data was, was on. Otherwise, you never knew where the data was. So, but to alleviate that complexity, you, you if you, Spend five to thirty grand, you can get a nice little BLE packet sniffer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, probably so the twenty thirty dollar range. Yeah, 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 I know. So if you're looking for something, yeah. I'll say cheap, okay, yeah. for a, for a sniffer, a BLE sniffer, there is one at Adafruit that you can buy. Okay, it's um, it, it uses a uh, Wireshark as the the interface to if you use that or know about that, uh, but it, it's a kind of a protocol analyzer that's programmable. But uh, they have a little dongle. Uh, it is a real, it's a sniffer and coupled with Wireshark. And it's, I'll, I'll say it's not um, the best in the world, but it's also not a $1,000 thing. It, you know, it's, I think it's like $50 or something like that. So it, I, I've used it and it's $25. A, $25. See, it's even dropping. <laughs> Give me 50 and I'll get you one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I found that uh, very useful in doing a lot of different designs. Now, it seems like the next step up from that $25 design is a, a sniffer that costs you about $1,000. And there's a few of those that are floating around out there. I've been using a $20 dongle from Best Buy and uh, something called USB Cap that comes with Wireshark when you install it. Okay. And it actually monitors the USB connection and captures that data, creates a PCAP file that you pull into Wireshark to analyze. Okay, yeah. so there's a few of those out there then. Yeah, the, it used to be Alysis. Um, they had a BLE, classic BLE, BLE and BLE, but it was like $20,000 for that unit, but. That company that does um, uh, Beagle, um, that not Beagle Bone, Beagle the, uh, that, uh, and Aardvark, you know that those series of tools they're mostly usb tools and spy and i2c yeah uh they're out in that they just came out with a sniffer yeah. too i forget their name um, 
thing of it, I'll say it. Yeah, you can, another great tool I've found that, I learned this from my customers, I'll give them credit. Um, you can turn on, your, on your Android phone, if you turn on debug mode, you can actually see, capture the HCI um, data. So that's, um, that can help you see what's going on on the phone side. You know, it's not the protocol over the air that the sniffer will capture, but it's, it gives you insight into what's happening, anything that's returning back. Because by the time you get the error on your phone, it just says broken, right? You don't have a clue. But if you look at the HCI packets coming back, um, you can, it, sometimes you'll get a, a better clue. So, so um, do you have a, I know you have your dongle for development, but do you have a way of putting your modules on a USB that will drop them into a OS defined environment like a Windows environment or a Linux environment? Um, you know, oh, a way to get your, your module adapted to an operating system computer device. So that dongle, that CY Smart dongle, Hmm. Um, I think you can do that with that dongle, right? Do you have, with that dongle, do you have, um, I don't hmm. know that you get standard operating system Bluetooth support through the dongle. Oh, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. That's standard Bluetooth. Bluetooth. Okay, so there's an, eight, we open up the APIs to talk to that, but it's not a, you couldn't use that as your Bluetooth for your laptop. Well, you could if you... You, you I, wrote I your driver. You can, I don't think you, that um, PSOC device that comes on the dongle, the USB support of it isn't programmable. So you can't change the plug and play stack that's on the USB interface that plugs into your computer to, to load different software, which is what you need to be able to do. I think we talked about, I, I took your, uh, I think it was two years ago that I took the Cypress course on the PSOC and mm -hmm. asked a similar question. Did I give it that course, that one you took? You, I think you told me that um, I could use your hardware and, you know, get into development mode with you guys. And there you go. That's what I, okay. That's my answer today. So <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you know, you, we, we give you a way yeah. to JTAG interface into the USB side of the dongle. Yeah, you can, up, you can reprogram what's on there. So hardware-wise, everything that you would need to do is there. Uh, Software-wise, it was never set up to do that, so that would be up to you. And we we don't have any plans to to turn that into your your PC wife uh, Bluetooth connection. And Might be an irrelevant question, so feel free to say it's irrelevant. <laughs> um, every time I play with metal to try to impact RSSI, it does like the opposite that I try to do. <laughs> it gets better. Sometimes, oh. yeah, yeah, it gets better. Like, um, try to make a Faraday cage and said it was an amplifier. Do you have any rules for... Um... Faraday cages have to be grounded. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Rule number one. <laughs> so the energy will dissipate. Got it. Energy must go somewhere. Common, co common problem I run into in people. <laughs> so, so you're trying to reduce the RSSI? Well, you're trying, you're trying to increase it? Or what are you like, trying to do with the RSSI? I was, I was trying to simulate the device being disconnected and I didn't want to have to walk away from the access point. So I put it inside a metal pot, just assuming that it was going to like drop. Instead, it got stronger. <laughs> I started walking down the neighborhood, and it was like amplifying it. Look at your, your Bluetooth lazing out of your coffee pot. Yeah. <laughs> so was this a Bluetooth device or Wi-Fi? No, it was Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Um, hmm. I think one of the ways you could do that, I know with Bluetooth, I'm not sure about the Wi-Fi, but you could turn the antenna off. Yeah. Yeah, it, it probably was cranking up the power on you. But, what I was just kind of curious, how you could use metal or not use metal, just to understand, like, how is metal going to impact other oh. solutions? And, well, I'll tell you, you can build a great little Faraday cage with um, copper flashing yeah. Yeah. From, a, from a home improvement warehouse and some metal uh, tape. No, um, uh, Dan, if you're trying to block 2.4 gigahertz <coughs> Wi-Fi, yeah. just use water. Water? The water? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Then it won't work. It'll never work again. Just put your device in the. <laughs> so, why don't we think that the the one of the things that a lot of people run into, whether it's Bluetooth or even Wi Fi, when they're building their product, their product tends to be metal oftentimes. And then they'll say, mm -hmm. okay, I have my antenna here. What's that going to do? And that's really a, a tough question to answer. We have some guys that, that can model it and say, okay, it's going to look like your pattern's going to look like this. We know, you know, in most cases, it's going to attenuate. You know, in some way, it's going to attenuate when you start adding that, that metal in there. Now, you know, if it's ungrounded metal and it's a certain shape, you know, there's a lot of funny things that can happen. But it, it's not a, a necessarily a trivial yeah. answer or something that's <coughs> not obvious of what it does. But if you put it inside metal and that metal is grounded, it shouldn't get out. Okay. Well, the other thing I'm thinking of are like my Christmas lights that are, and I had to turn off Wi-Fi on them because um, it got to where it would um, try to, it would lose the connection and then hang on my lights and, and they're far out in the yard and up in trees and things like that. <coughs> And um, so I was wondering if I could do something with metal to amplify it or... Um. Yeah, there used to be a Pringles can, remember that on, the, on Google? Oh yeah, you said it's a directionalized antenna? Yeah. 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 I don't know if it worked. Yeah. I might just play with some things. The uh, drone people at NC State were playing with, um, not Wi-Fi, but it was a similar technology for their telemetry, and they used the parabolic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the only issue was don't stand in front of their <laughs> interface because you'll get cooked. They had it. Because so, yeah, the, the antennas right. will take a low power, what seemingly low power device and, and expand the power on it tremendously. <laughs> well, especially, like you said, the Pringles can. I mean, you're focusing it, so instead of radiating it, right. you know, it's globally, directional. you're, you're yeah. focusing the energy down into a very small piece of it. Right. Yeah. We, we get questions a lot of times, which, which, which is the best antenna we use, because you'll see modules that have, like, pretty rough antennas, <coughs> and things like that. And the real answer is, it depends. You put, you put any other type of metal around it, you put batteries and things like that, until you get into a chamber and actually see, you know, what the pattern is and things like that, um, it, it, can be, it can be virtually anything, surrounding components uh, and things like that. So we've seen printed PCB antennas have phenomenal omnidirectional performance, and then, you know, other things, just like changes in its part. Yeah. yeah. I think what we should do is, because um, there's some of us who ask questions all night, but we don't want to keep everyone here. So let's go ahead and um, thank you guys. But um, if you guys still have questions, please come up, and we'll keep on doing questions for those of us like me who like can ask questions all night. <laughs> and um, want to thank everyone for coming tonight. And um, don't forget, next month is at um, Inventus, and especially if you are an ideas person and want to ever make a product, that'd be a great meeting to go to. And then we also have our um, Civic Hackathon Assist IoT on, is it the 17th of February? So um, stay tuned to meet up, and those events will be posted shortly. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Cypress. Oh, what is the Internet of Things? Is it hardware, software, or both? Well, chances are you already have it in your pocket. It might be on your wrist. Recently popular are fitness bands with accelerometers and gyroscopes to monitor our activities and heart rate. Now we have smartwatches which do all of that, play music, and they can answer messages. Smartphones and tablets have replaced maps, secretaries, alarm clocks, entertainment, and now they can control our homes, change the TV, the temperature, security, and lights all from your device. Our cars are even getting smarter with sensors to keep us safe. The Internet of Things is simply using technology to mimic the human experience and simplify life.